thank you so much, Dean Karamane. It's a really delight to be here. So it really is an honor to participate in tonight's celebration and a, and a special honor to introduce our next speaker, a very special one, former George Washington University student and now the president of Georgia, His Excellency, Mikhail Saakashvili. So, Pre President Mikhail Saakashvili was elected president of Georgia in a landslide victory in 2004. At the time of his election, he was the youngest serving president in Europe. Before becoming the country's third president, he spent 10 years in Georgian politics serving as a member of its Human Rights Commission and as Minister of Justice. His commitment to opposing government corruption, corruption and improving international relations has earned him praise from leaders around the world. In 2005, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of his, quote, extraordinary commitment to peace and to the universal values of democracy, individual liberty, and civil rights. President Saakashvili graduated with honors from the prestigious Kiev University Institute of International Relations before earning his Master of Laws degree from Columbia University. He then attended doctoral classes at the George Washington Law School, studying under Professor Bergenthal, whom he once called his favorite lawyer of all time. <laughs> President Saakashvili left GW to enter politics in his home country. And it's, by the way, it's not it's not always the case that the reason a student leaves is to become president of his home <laughs> of the country. Um, and, uh, uh, and just a month after he was elected president, our university was honored to bestow upon him the GW President's Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, President Mikhail Saakashvili. Um, I went to GW a while ago. Uh, we have here uh, students of GW who were not even born. I see a couple of them in the hall <laughs> at that time. So I would mention exactly the, uh, I mean, it was back in 94, 95, 96. However, I have to see that uh, there is uh, uh, Ralph Steinhardt here, whom I recall very well. Uh, most importantly, there are also two ladies, Shehanash Joshi and uh, Dana Shelton. And the problem is, what I, I, I have a problem here because they haven't changed a bit for all this. Uh, and, well, <laughs> I mean, I should have stayed here, I think. <laughs> there is something very special about this place. And um, so actually, uh, it happened so that I came to the U.S. on a congressional scholarship uh, back in 1993, um, and uh, I went to Columbia Law School, and I was, which was blessed at that time, and I was lucky that it had amazing professors uh, like uh, Oscar Schachter, uh, Lou Henkin, and they were, uh, Oscar was my uh, supervisor there, and he, um, I worked very closely with him. And Oscar Schachter, for those of you who don't know, he wrote the UN Charter uh, uh, back in the 40s. Uh, so I was lucky to be taught by somebody who wrote the UN Charter of that very useless organization anyway, but uh, some people think, but the Charter is very good, and actually it has no very mechanism, but, uh, but in, from all points of view, um, uh, and then Lou Hankin, and Lou Hankin during lectures used to, and he was like big thinker, of course he was one of the founder, basically pioneer of international law in America, right? Uh, and so. During the lectures, which I think I really hated about him, he, would, uh, he was an old kind of cold warrior. And so he would uh, go around and see, so whatever happens, you know, disarmament talks and this conflict and that conflict, he would turn in, in front of 300 people and said, it's their fault, at, pointing at me, like Soviet Union. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I, was, I hated Soviet Union 10 times more than Lou Hankin even <laughs> would, would imagine, but, but that's, that's so that's, and then what happened that I applied, well, I had this one year study, uh, of masters obviously, and then I understood that I don't know enough, that it's not enough for anything. So I was looking around and, um, and obviously we had, uh, and uh, I looked at George Washington because before in Strasbourg, Dinah Shelton was twice there, my lecturer at the International Institute of Human Rights from which I also have that diploma. 
and she was teaching me with book of uh, Tom Burgenthal, obviously. Then I attended his lecture also in Budapest, and Tom Burgenthal was an absolute legend, yeah, we all know. I mean, he was a uh, uh, founding uh, member of Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which was really hot court, and we learned those cases in Strasbourg, and it's something that really concerned individual fates of lots of people, and that was, if you ask me what was one single important instrument that changed America, especially in uh, South and Latin, in general Central America, that was that court. I mean, it really had a considerable impact. <laughs> because for many decades before that, the dictatorial regimes thought that no matter what, what they would do, it was holy, it was something that was meant to be done, and they would always get away. And suddenly, this group of, uh, and especially Tom Burgenthal, who was first ever American judge to be you know, appointed there, come there and say, wait, wait a minute, the time of impunity is over. And you, you people, there is finally a place where you can go to. So, 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 so I obviously applied for a um, doctoral program, which actually, as you know, it's another master's, in fact, because you have to earn credits for another year, and then you, you just uh, have to submit your doctorate. And I came here, and uh, uh, it was obviously a very interesting time, very interesting experience. I went a lot to congressional uh, hearings, um, uh, do things in D.C., and uh, Shehernaz was extremely generous, and uh, with her time and attention, and I also got tuition waiver, and this also really thanks to Tom and Shehernaz. Um, and, and then and he had amazing seminars. From those of you who are lucky enough to be, to attend them, you know that, what I'm talking about. But there was this thing that uh, at one seminar, already in the end of my studies, it was second semester, um, my classmate from New Zealand, uh, in the end of the seminar, I don't know what brought this conversation, but she said, you know, she raised this issue with um, uh, the movie uh, that had just appeared, uh, Schindler's List, by, uh, of course, by Spielberg. And so she started to kind of approach Tom Burgetta, what do you think about this movie? And he tried to avoid the subject. And he moved to another, he continued the seminar. She kept moving back, bringing him back to Schindler's List. So he said, you know, I cannot watch this movie. I don't, I'm not, I'm not watched it, I'm, I'm not going to watch it because I've seen it and I, it's not, not so, and then we start to say, please tell us what, you, what, what, what did you see, what, what, what's your experience? So it was, I remember very well, it was somewhere uh, after, like maybe one o'clock in the afternoon. And, um, and he started to recount the story. And, uh, and we basically, we got, I mean, we, it started and uh, he told the story which we, like we were glued to our chairs and he finished telling it in f up to almost like two and a half, three hours he was telling. And we didn't feel how it passed. It was one minute, just like that. Uh, and we relieved much more than any movie can show you. Uh, and the story was amazing. The way how they were taken away from last ship to be taken to the camp. How his father, who was a very prominent and amazing man, how he basically tried to protect people in the camp for all these years in uh, Auschwitz and uh, how in the end, after this death march, and I was, uh, I remember it very well exactly because I went to Auschwitz also in January, and the first thing I remember was you telling me about the death march, about this cold, cold weather there uh, before you were taking to Sachsenhausen, and how his brother succumbed in the end, and how his father basically gave himself in because he could not tolerate that he couldn't protect his son. And how then, in the end, Tom was put on in that horrible place. Which I mean, I saw this Ken Chamber. Until you see it, you cannot imagine how perverse a human being can be. I mean, it, no matter what you see on television, you, once you are there, you, you just it's something else. And uh, so they were put on that death. Uh, and there is, the, I, there is this book which I also saw, and there it tells the story, but when it, he told it, this was, I, I never forget that, um, that, uh, you know, they had to gather a certain amount of prisoners before they would send them to gas chamber. And they still lacked few of them. So they had uh, 
couple of hundred, but they elect a few of them. And because of this Nazi order, orderly way, even if they knew that they, were, they had no time left, because obviously the army was approaching that would uh, liberate this camp, uh, they didn't put them there because they thought that they had rules to follow, whatever rules there were. And, uh, and that's how he survived. And then he told us a story about post-war Germany, how they were treated, about his quest to find his mother through Red Cross and all the other things, um, and how finally they got reunited, and how then he got to Harvard, uh, to, to at first several American universities, and finally to Harvard. And uh, these are the stories that, this is the story which I no other story in my life made on me bigger impression, let's put it this way. Uh, and um, so this is somebody, somebody with his experience also understands every oppressed person worldwide very well. That's why I think ICJ was extremely lucky to have him as on the court. And he left incredible trace in, in there. I know from, from uh, people whom I know that very well and they're out the ICJ. They created a very important precedence in the inter-American court, but also a uh, very important uh, a legacy at ICJ. And most importantly, you are his legacy. You are his people. You are the people who, uh, uh, who, who will make something that Brugenthal is doing so important. Now, I have two things to do. First of all, when I was uh, leaving the university, uh, so I got elected in the Georgian parliament, and I was elected as I went back, and I was head of uh, to the parliament. The Georgia Parliament now who is a student at GW. Uh, before you needed qualification of being from GW to become <laughs> member of Georgia <laughs> Parliament. <laughs> now it's vice versa. <laughs> so, which speaks better of the GW, how it progressed. By the way, in the rankings, it rose way up since then. Uh, and so, so I went to him and I said, "Here is, uh, you know, I had, I had very complicated." subject of international law, which I still cannot fully pronounce. It was in Latin. Uh, and so, so I went to him and said, a professor, I mean, I just got elected to the parliament. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, don't, uh, you know, I, but don't worry. I'll write this page. I'll get back to you. Uh, <laughs> and so he looked at me with, yeah. <laughs> and so, so here he was, and um, uh, and then he told me, and um, and he told me, but you know, you drop this complicated subject. You should do dissertation on some other subject. I said, like what? You know, like building a new country. <laughs> uh, I said, what kind of legal subject is this? Is it I mean, how how legal is it, professor? <laughs> He said, well, I don't know how legal is it, but that's exactly what you'll be doing for the years to come. Um, and I have to report to you, Professor, uh, that indeed we, I, 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 we went, I went, when I went to Georgia, it was a failed country. It was a country which had no electricity, it was, it got, it was run by kleptocrats, uh, or was not run at all, but you know, they pretend to run it. Uh, it was full of crime. Uh, when I got back, you know, bullets were just flying when all the, we had no electricity, we had no elementary amenities and things. Now, Georgia, under my presidency, has become, according to the World Bank, and for small countries, benchmarks matter, world's number one uh, reformer based on eight years' data. We became, uh, we became, according to the World Bank, uh, uh, on the World Bank list of do, the best uh, doing business, is of doing business, the best business destination in the world, number nine. And first, developing country ever to make this, this top 10 because it's headed by Singapore, US is number five on that list, say Germany is number 17, uh, and Georgia had been the only one from Eastern Central Europe, and for number one reform in Eastern Central Europe, easiest place in Eastern Central Europe and post-Soviet space all uh, and to, do, to do business, but actually also uh, an, uh, first developing country to make this top, to this top 10. According to the World Bank, we had the world's fastest uh, customs procedure, world's fastest uh, ident ID issuance, world's fastest property transactions, uh, world's fastest uh, company registration. So we were, as I told you, the one of the most criminalized countries in the world, and we became, according to the European Union, the least um, uh, criminalized country in terms of crime rate in Europe. We, 
we uh, basically outperformed Iceland on that. Uh, <laughs> 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 and we and we became in last year of my pre last, last year of uh, you know just one year before my term expires end of this year. Uh, but last year we became the least um, corrupt country in Europe according on the data or to the data of uh, uh, of um, the European Union. Uh, so so that's. That's what I have, I'm just reporting to you the results of whatever you told me to do. So, two things. You told me to write dissertation about how to build new country. I brought you something. It's not really my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a. It's you should a, have submitted it. <laughs> it's a. It's a. It's a thing. What was built under my presidency for the last six years, uh, New Georgia, actually, all the buildings and new cities we developed. I have claimed that I think we did it best of all, at least in our region and maybe worldwide. So, that's, whatever it could be considered. But, <laughs> <laughs> whatever the academic, <laughs> academic things. Are. And the other thing, the other thing, the other thing, obviously, you know, on behalf of my nation, and this is bigger than our relations, obviously, uh, and my, just my respect for him, for this amazing work you've done for just great cause of humanity worldwide, and really one of the greatest persons of what you can say, representatives of our human race, really here. here, here. And uh, on behalf of Georgia Nation, I want to give you the Medal of Excellence, and I think that's the least of the things that can characterize your existence and your achievements. The thing that President Chakas really didn't tell you. Uh, one day he came to me, I don't know whether it was in the first or second semester, and he said, could I be excused for a week? And I said, why? Well, I have to go home and run for parliament. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, can you do that? Oh, yes. And he came back, had run in parliament before I knew it. He was head of the faction in, in parliament and minister of justice where I'm told he did a magnificent job because of the, the serious problems that uh, Georgia had with justice and corruption. And then he became president. I wish I could take credit for it. I, I uh, <laughs> my colleague says, go ahead. <laughs> but, but I can't. And, I, and I'm profoundly honored to, to see him here. And uh, I also wish him the next time around to again become president of Georgia. Uh, I should tell you I'm particularly pleased and honored with the medal because in, in The Hague, all of my colleagues and the ambassadors all had medals. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. I wish you'd given it to me before. <laughs> but it's, it's wonderful what you have done and I'm profoundly honored uh, by your honoring me today, I should tell you like we always say, but I really mean it, I really don't deserve it. You deserve all the praise. Thank you. Thank you.